is a panel looking at people power in relationship to stability, sustainability, and growth. Uh, we're calling it the driving demand. So I'm Monica Kopp, I mentioned earlier, I'm a professor here at the Bolotnik School of Government. And I'm joined by two very prominent individuals. Uh, we have Professor Jack Goldstone, who's joining us from George Mason University. And he's a political sociologist who's done a lot of work on actually demography. And we're recently looking at the relationship of demography, international security, uh, and economic development. Um, and so he's going to be joining us and talking a bit about his more recent research uh, and some ideas about how sort of demographic changes are influencing these different aspects that we're interested in. I'm also joined by Jonathan Witzel, who joins us from the McKinsey uh, Corporation. And he's an expert on China. He spent the last 15 years in Shanghai, is that correct? Um, and he looks a lot at cities and urbanization and development in China. So I'm going to start with you, Jack. Um, you're, I know you're working on a book, but you had a very important piece come out in Foreign Affairs a couple of years ago, looking at sort of mega trends. Um, and and uh, sort of issues that are really going to sort of confound states, but also the global system. And uh, you know, looking at in particular looking at demography, so aging, youth, um, uh, sort of shifting of power, economic and material power. So, I wonder if you can just talk to about that and, and what it means, sort of, in terms of people power in the conference today. These these demographic shifts that you isolated in that piece. Well, these population shifts will have a big impact on what kinds of issues people want to mobilize around. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk about three. Um, one is the real wave of aging that's hitting the rich countries. Um, and you know, someone said, it seems that Europe is trying to become the most comfortable old age retirement home in the world. Uh, the problem there is that it's going to push people to disengage. People are looking at their own short-term generational interests. And so the real question for people in Europe is, will young people be heard? Will they get a chance? Right now, there's a generation being wasted in Europe, uh, being left out of the job market, uh, and they will need to mobilize for themselves. Now, the real big surge in young people is taking place elsewhere in the world. Uh, Paul Collier here did a book called The Bottom Billion about the poor people in the world. But the real issue, I think, is going to come from what I call the, the booming billions, the billion people in China, the billion in India, the billion in Latin America, and the one or two billion coming in Africa uh, who are trying to get into the global middle class. Uh, and the demands that these people will put on their governments and on the world, I think, will have the biggest impact on sustainability in the future. Uh, and related to this uh, imbalance between these you know, booming young populations in uh, the South and the aging population in the rich countries is going to be the issue of migration. Uh, there are going to be a lot of people wanting to move, uh, follow the opportunities, follow the money. And so there's going to be a lot of mobilization around freedom versus barriers. Uh, are we going to keep barriers up to try and uh, insulate the rich countries from the rest of the world? Or are we going to open that up and create opportunities? I think that's also going to be a big issue for mobilization in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things in reading the piece, you have this very controversial policy option at the end, where you say if you're, it, it's not that people want to move north, how about shifting some population south? And it's an intriguing idea, because the idea, you say the service industry, if you move a lot of elderly south, they doubt it's going to happen, although many West Europeans do buy homes sort of in warmer climates. And that's right. So, that, so the, 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 the migration could be both ways, although right. you seem quite skeptical. It seems like you put it out there as an well, idea. Here's what I think and what worries me about the world. And that is, you know, we talked this morning about mm -hmm. people power and politics. Uh, and the question was raised, is that going to push us toward greater democracy? Or is it going to be leveraged by nationalist groups, extremist religion? And I think that the balance depends on whether people are inspired by hope or by fear. If people have hope for a better future and hope that they will be trusted and welcomed with the people they're working with and trying to communicate with, uh, then you get alliances, you get the growth of positive movements. Uh, and so I hope you know, north-south cooperation, trust, mm -hmm. will lead people to move, uh, whether for retirement or for jobs. You're a good example of, <laughs> of someone who moved to China and built a career there. Um, my anxiety, though, is what we're seeing in North Africa, what we're seeing in parts of Asia now, the kind of strong religious backlash, will create fear. Mm -hmm. And when you get fear, 
people turn to religion, nationalism, uh, neighborhood, tribalism, and they build barriers to protect themselves. And that will prevent the movement of people, that prevent the movement of ideas and capital, all the things that we need. So if you ask me, uh, what do I think will happen in the future? I'd say today the glass is half full, half empty, but I'm worried that it's kind of draining at the bottom, that the global economic slowdown is pushing people toward the fear. And so I think we really need to address some of the fundamental economic imbalances, get growth going, build hope for the future, and then you can get some of that north south <coughs> awareness and trust. So Jack, that's movement across states. Uh, Jonathan, a lot of your work has been within China and the massive rates of urbanization and the Chinese government sort of coming to grips with that. Uh, you've written quite a bit about sort of the technological innovation that's needed, the physical infrastructure, and then of course the, the concern about environmental degradation. Uh, how is China adapting? Uh, is, you know, I think upwards of 60%, they're expecting by 2030, of Chinese population to be urbanized, which is a huge movement. And we're seeing this globally, huge urbanization. So what can we learn from China as a state that does seem to have the capacity to do this? Uh, and for China itself, and then of course globally for some of the issues that Jack has raised. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. So, first of all, thank you. You're welcome. Um, as a McKinsey person, I find very few opportunities to use my PhD in political science. So <laughs> <laughs> here I have one. Um, the, oh, it's a, uh, of course, it's a transformation. When I speak to classrooms in China, I usually ask people, how many of you were born in the countryside? And 10 or 15% of the room sticks up their hand. And then how about your parents? And then another 20 or 30. And how about your grandparents? And then another 30 or 40. And this point, you know, 80% of the room has their hands up. And I note that that is a very different reaction than perhaps if I was to do this in the average UK classroom. Uh, so you simply have a interesting moment in time, a window, and it only happens once. And I've looked for this. There is no recorded instance in human history of de-urbanization. Uh, so it's pretty much a one-way street. I actually believe it's fundamentally much more of a social than an economic uh, transformation, and that people leave the countryside out of a triumph of hope over whatever, of experience. So they go because they believe there's something to be gotten, and they're actually leaving something behind, at least in the case of China. Two factors make that particularly so. One was uh, one-child policy and the other was land reform, uh, both of which contributed to uh, essentially people not getting pushed off the land. And so there was, there was actually very little economic reason uh, to have a rapid march of urbanization. And for that reason, in fact, China's urbanization was by the World Bank's reckoning, at least, uh, quite delayed. So you go to the 80s and you look at you know, correlations of urbanization and GDP per capita, and you say, China, where, where are your cities? Um, and uh, you know, by the way, we'll be happy to give you the billions of dollars to, to build them, uh, which the Chinese said, no, thank you very much. We'll wait till we have our billions of dollars, and then we will build them. And that is pretty much what happened. And so as China accumulated the capital uh, from the initial wave of productivity in the countryside, uh, through land reform, through, through collectives, reform of the collectives, and to some extent through uh, processing uh, light, light industry assembly and manufacturing, it created capital and so it started to uh, invest that in urbanization. Mm -hmm. now, with all of that, I mean, there's this dramatic transformation that's going on where people move to the city and they now become different people. Now, the city is essentially an engine of productivity. Uh, it takes people uh, from a essentially uh, marginal sort of non uh, uh, into, well, I, I can't, think, can't remember the exact economics uh, jargon, but essentially they're not part of a modern economy. It puts them in a place where they can get access to skills and uh, increase their, their productivity, and all of that then creates a whole different environment. So this is you know, the, you know, the, the magic of the city, which is uh, an economic magic, but it's also equally important a social one. So they, they think about themselves differently. They dress differently. They have different standards of personal hygiene. They have different ways of communicating with each other. They save differently. They, they, they travel differently. And so they're, they're new people. And uh, you know, so yes, now we have this dramatic transformation. Now, are they truly new? Uh, I don't think you can say that. Of course, there is a, there's a base template, if you will, to any Chinese slash Confucian society. Uh, and I think that has, to some extent, contributed to the rather 
uh, alarmingly harmonious process that we've seen today. I mean, in which other country in the world can you, first of all, seriously imagine the government putting forward a goal of having a harmonious society without having everybody snickering on the street? Um, but there is, to some extent, that re a resonation of that. And then the facts are it is. You've already urbanized 300 million people. Albeit most of that was you went to sleep as a, as a rural resident and you woke up as an urban one, so the city basically drew its boundaries around you. And now we've got another 300 million to go. So what has contributed to this is a, is a quite stable, if you will, or I shouldn't say stable, it's probably more like a resilient uh, political structure that has uh, been willing as needed to experiment, particularly in the more recent years in uh, areas where there are more migrants, we see more experimentation. Uh, coupled with a, as they would say, very strong implementation capability uh, in as much as the physical stuff just gets done uh, as the money goes from state bank to state construction company to state enterprise back to state bank. And so this capability is there to put physical infrastructure in the ground in a way which most, uh, most emerging markets don't have, plus of course the end result of the, being able to own, technically to own all the land means you can make those decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, you, you will wear the consequences of them, but you mm -hmm. can make the decisions. So I guess those two things, I mean, mm -hmm. that uh, resilience of the political structure and, mm -hmm. and the implementation mm -hmm. capability. And Jack, you've written about places in the world where there may not be the resilience, right? And the governments right. don't have the capacity. So when you talk about your booming billions, it's happening in countries where there's low levels, or high levels of poverty, and there may be levels of education, but it's not quality education. You really stress that in your writing about how you have the states that don't have the capacity to absorb these populations in part because they haven't trained up the population. China seems to have maybe done a better job. So what does it mean in, in other corners of the world, this massive rate of urbanization with these more youthful populations that have aspirations that the governments may not be able to meet? Well, it means bigger risks, the type of risks that we've seen in North Africa and the Middle East in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, China is a very exceptional case. <laughs> and I think that the real, uh, real puzzle for me is whether uh, Africa, Brazil uh, can be as successful as China in managing uh, urbanization without a crash of uh, the political system. Uh, Chinese cities are kind of the happy growth. Uh, the alternative, if you look around the world, that there are cities like Karachi and Lagos where urbanization is much more sprawling, weakly governed, and these cities have very high rates of crime, uh, organized crime, casual crime, unemployment. Um, these are not happy futures in the sense that you look, you know, you go to Shanghai, you feel like you've gone into the future. It's a you know, beautiful, mostly well-groomed, uh, you know, there's some ugly suburbs and, and spreading, but still you can see progress all around you. Uh, whereas you go to some other cities uh, of 10 million or so and you see chaos. Now, the, I think the real advantage that China has had is that the uh, government was resilient enough, um, but it stayed focused since 1980 on achieving economic growth. Uh, in fact, this has been the pattern in Korea, in Japan. You had leaders who, whatever the level of uh, political corruption and whatever the level of lining their pockets, they still put a primary value on strengthening their country growing their economy. At the end of the day, they wouldn't do things that stop that process. Whereas in a lot of countries, and Argentina and Brazil, as well as countries in Africa, you have politicians who are more concerned, as Luis said this morning, with getting elected, uh, showering favors on their constituents, and managing for their short-term personal benefit, rather than for the good of the country. So we do need leadership. Uh, that will essentially start to think about how do we uh, make urbanization, economic growth, uh, the education of youth really work for growth rather than um, how do I look good in the next election. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to return to one of your, so you made, a, Jonathan, a point about saying that in China, at least at this point, it's largely a social phenomenon, right? That people are sort of changing uh, socially. But the question is, is will they start making demands politically? And I think it's premised on whether the economic engine in China can keep humming, right? We've heard a lot, or mentioned a couple of times this morning about the rise of the middle class and in India, China, Pakistan, we're seeing a middle class really emerge and they're gonna put pressure on political systems. Uh, what is your sense? Are these urban areas, you know, China is concerned about the concentration of power. In this case, you're talking about social power, but this becoming translated into political power 
such that this regime may not be as resilient, especially if it can't keep the economic engine humming to satisfy the, the, the desires and needs of this consumerist class that's emerging. Sure. I mean, when we look at cities around the world, first of all, when we say social, it is not at the expense of either economic or environment. A sustainable city includes you know, great performance on social, environmental, and economic grounds. And we actually don't see any, we see meaningful correlation across those three. We, you cannot continue to grow your economy if you destroy your, your, your environment. You cannot expect to have environmental progress if your society is in a complete mess. I mean, these things essentially go together. And every ranking of cities everywhere in the world will kind of show you a reasonably high correlation over time. So and I think the Chinese government kind of got the message. I mean, if you didn't, they could just you know look out the window, uh, and uh, that's the joke, right? I mean, a Shanghai guy and a Beijing guy and says, be, uh, Beijing guy says, you know, we're so lucky, you know, we can open the window, we get a free cigarette. And the Shanghai guy <laughs> says, no, hey, it's nothing. I turn on the turn on the tap and I get pork chop soup. Right? So the um, you know there there is clearly a recognition that you have to address these things, and that coupled with this urbanization is happening. Incidentally, roughly at the same speed, I would interestingly note, as the UK did. The UK urbanized over about 50 or 60 years, going from about 25% urbanized to about 65% urbanized. And every year it's a 1 or 2%, which is why I think it's a social phenomenon. Somebody just flips a switch, uh, and all of a sudden people start to go. And then in the case of the UK, this happened, of course, in the 1800s. So the average income of, the, of res, rural to urban was multiplied by 2. That was the effect there. Now, China's doing this in the 21st century, and so you just have that much more technology to, to, to catch up on, and as a result, the average income of rural to urban goes by three. Uh, so this is obviously a huge economic impact. Um, so to start off, you kind of get this huge tailwind. So at this, day, this stage, China is just generating too much cash. This is its problem. So it's, this issue is a generational one, sort of like, and a distributional one. So who should get all that cash? Uh, now, all that's happening at the same time as you bring all these people in. And the, the other fact of technology, as is mentioned before, is that we are in a technical era. Does anybody want to take a guess of how many people are on QQ today? This is China's version of Twitter. It's 180 million. Uh, and it never goes below 50 million. So at 4.30 4 in the morning, there are 50 million people on QQ trying to hook up. You know, so this is you know, an incredible difference in terms of how the dialogue and the debate is going on. You can't. And finally, plus you can't really step on something if you, before it's there. So there's there's always there's now just this, this seething cauldron of the Chinese internet, which alerts the government to things it better do something about pretty pretty fast. So all of which is to say that you know I I, I sense there is a clearly a recognition of the requirements for change in governance and the capability. And the way the Chinese government would respond is say, well, we need better government. And they literally mean that, better government. We want the government to be better. We want you to you know, be smarter, make better decisions, work harder. This is a Confucian society. We have a bell curve. You're supposed to be at the right-hand side. And the words of the Singapore complaints chorus, if you're not the best, you're just one of the rest. Uh, so this is as a meritocracy is the, is the Chinese government response. That said, recognize that you know, civil society has to have a much greater role. So, you know, I you know, see plenty of, uh, of anguish on the face of government bureaucrats who are trying to figure out, well, how can I literally, me, sitting here in this office, be responsible for you know, 10,000 civil service organizations? And, and am I, how am I supposed to guarantee that none of these people are going to be fraudulent or going to do weird things in the name of their organization? And you know, it's, my, it's my responsibility as government. So redefining government in that way to say, what is the actual compact between civil society and government and between the people of China and its government? That's an interesting debate. That's a really interesting one. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Mark, well, can, can yeah, I yeah. address your question about growth? I, mean, I think it's yeah. important. We need growth. It's very hard to satisfy people without it. But one problem is getting growth. The other is managing growth. And if you don't manage growth for equity, distribution and quality of life, that's when you start to get these emerging middle class protests. The North African countries looked good on top line economic growth. They were growing four or five percent. Brazil looked great on economic growth before the protests in the last year. Turkey's had good growth before the Gezi Park, but the growth didn't satisfy people's demands for improvements in their daily quality of life because the growth would go to government projects or to uh, corrupt elites. And so growth is one part, but it doesn't ensure you against protest. It can generate protest if yeah. things don't follow. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things, though, that you, one of the data points that you point out in your work, which again makes China sort of exceptional, but not North, North Africa, is that the GDP per capita in these urban areas, actually, so when, when 
Britain did it, there was a higher GDP per capita, but in many of these urban areas, they don't have growth. So there's no growth really to manage. And so you end up getting these urban areas that are, are squalid or in squalor. And so the question is, is then what can governments do? How do they sort of harness resources in order, minimal resources in order to prevent sort of the fear or the, right. the aspiration that people have? So it's not the middle class in all these cases. China, it seems to be in parts of the cases that you talk about, Jack. But in other cases, it is not the middle class. It is the impoverished bottom billion that we're talking well, about. Well, one of the problems we see in world history is the middle class is not always an engine for good and for growth. Because if the middle class feels it can pull up the ladders behind it, um, sometimes the middle class will uh, shake hands with the government and uh, high elites and say, protect us. Um, I'm going to Guatemala later this year. And Guatemala was a horrific case where the middle class supported a military dictatorship to oppress the indigenous elite as a way to, because they essentially were, were given a menu of fear. They were told, if you have democracy, the middle class will be destroyed by the demands of the poor, so we have to oppress the poor. Mm -hmm. So these dialogues, these kind of shifting arrangements go on all the time. This is where popular voice, activism, communication is important to get people aware of you know, what the real picture is. Mm -hmm. Because what I find, in those cities that don't have strong governance from the top, uh, you get criminal organizations moving in to provide the service, the order, the governance that these urban spaces need. Uh, you see it in Jamaica, you see it in uh, the favelas in Rio. Um, and so that is, I think, the real contest, whether we have really you know, good governance that's capable of improving people's lives, or whether people take government into their own hands, sometimes for better, but often for worse. So why don't we open it up to questions for now? Um, there's two mics. So we'll start here in the front, Cornelia. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Cornelia Meyer from MRL Corporation. And I have, uh, th the first question goes to um, Dr. Wurzel, and that is, um, I know in the long run we're all dead, but before we're all dead, I would like to look at the longer run. I look at China now, but one child policy has one effect. It will soon be one of the fastest aging populations in the world. So the question is, how can you know, the social services keep up with it? In other words, will China get rich before she gets old, or will she get old before she gets rich? And how do you look at the, you know, let, let's look down 20 years at the fast aging um, population and how, how then you will manage welfare in China. And to Professor Goldstone, my particular area of activity is the Middle East. And I look at the Middle East and they are, you're absolutely right, everything you said is right. What we need is Middle East, North Africa, 100 million jobs within the next decade to move ahead. And in order to do that, we also, you mentioned education, we need to adjust the education systems. But when I look at the government policies, they're all on higher education, universities. What we really need also are vocational training, apprenticeships. You can't find a plumber in Cairo. But you know, you, in order to employ everybody, you need, and that takes an attitudinal shift, because if you're a plumber, you can't find a, a wife, because nobody will marry you off if you don't have, your daughter off, his daughter off if you don't have a university degree. So that takes an attitudinal shift as well. So how do you look at that sort of space and education and providing jobs? So let's take a couple. Uh, thank you, Ahmed Safar, I'm um, um, MPP candidate at the Blavante School of Government. Um, well, I don't know what to start really, I was, uh, the debate has been quite rich so far. Uh, but I, I would like to stop at the hope versus fear um, um, conundrum that you've mentioned. And how, how, to, how to look at the, the cup in terms of half full, half empty. When you're talking about a Asian population, where generational interests um, will, will be bounded within a particular generation and how intergenerational dialogue um, not, not coming through in, the, in that regard. Because how much uh, fear or hope will be inherited depends on how much intergenerational inter responsibility is actually being um, managed. Um, on the other um, um, topic that you mentioned about North Africa, and 
again, it brings back the, the, um, the question of um, freedom versus barriers and how much of, of that is actually contributing to the lack of grassroots changes because what happened in the Arab Spring is, is, is not really what you call grassroots. It didn't happen slowly and you know, took its time to, to, to mature and lessons learned. It, it did happen in a moment of history. And some people argue that grassroots movements are taking place right now rather than have taken place um, at the exact moment of, of the Arab Spring. And just enough, a final note about China, really. Um, are, we, are we missing the formula of, of um, China's exceptional kind of um, success story in a way? And just by the fact that China is exceptional, doesn't it, that just make it harder for China to, to, to make that breakthrough? And whether we could have profound lessons learned from that? Thank you. Down here, up here. Gwen Bevan, London School of Economics. It's following on from the, it's your question about the, the demographic shift. And um, when I teach my students about this, it, it's this extraordinary transformation in South Korea. So within a generation, you go from a young population to an aging one. And it's this funda, I mean, it's just the speed with which these things happen just seems to me terribly difficult. And the other issue that touches on the point you raised about the inequality distribution, you know, as, as countries, I mean, it's a classic thing, you know, it's um, Paul Krugman about the United States, you know, um, from post-World War till about the 1980s, America got richer, everyone got richer. After that, was, you know, the small 1%, the Occupy Wall Street is all about that. But I think the thing I find, I mean, that's troubling in itself, but the thing I find even more troubling looking back over my lifetime is the sense in which governments don't worry about geographical inequality. So that, you know, when I was in my 20s, governments tried to do something about the economically deprived areas and would subsidize steel and coal to keep employment there. Now governments don't do that. And we have a, you know, an economically active southeast and the rest is left. In Germany, you have the East Germany left behind and so the, and the old people and children there and the young active people go to the west. In Italy, you've got the north-south divide. And you, I just feel it's this deeply troubling thing, and then it plays into government because they tend not to be well governed because the able people have left. So the thing, well, that's one, I just wonder what your views are on this. I, I find that a terribly difficult problem. Right. So, aging China, economic edge, and Jonathan, why don't we start with you on uh, is China going to age before it grows, or is it going to grow before it ages, and what are the implications of that? Sure. Well, um, I, I actually wanted to come back to your equity point at some point. The, uh, uh, but they used to joke always about the World Expo, and you would see the China Pavilion, it looks like this, and people would say that's going to be the China's demographic pyramid in the year 2030, something like that. So, you know, essentially, China has had, of course, the single most favorable demographic moment ever that will ever have that happened a couple of years ago, I think. And so now, from now on out, it's all, it's all bad news. Uh, the, um, so, yeah, we're gonna, uh, China will get older. Um, China is already uh, a, you know, early developing country, I guess. Um, and, you know, is just reading today, is piling up $30 billion a month in foreign exchange surplus. So uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's rich, but uh, certainly there's a lot of money in the bank right now. The real question is how do we hang on to that? And how do we, uh, and the investments that are being made today, will they be, uh, product, will they support the enhancement of productivity in the economy? Which boils down to the service sector, and growth in small and medium-sized enterprises and employment to your equity point because that is basically how you boost consumption because you don't have a job, you don't have income, you don't have income, you don't have consumption. So jobs only come from services. Uh, there's, no, there's been no increase in manufacturing sector jobs in China for the last two decades. Uh, so that, you know, this, this has, and services in fact are quite capital intensive. The problem is how do you actually get the capital to the services? Um, because it's all small and medium-sized enterprise. So uh, this is, uh, you know, this is, this, however, this, the facts are it's going pretty well and the service sector is growing faster than industry and consumption is growing faster than GDP. So net, you know, at least, you know, things, it's an inefficient process at best, but we're, we're, we're going to get there. So China will, you know, all things considered, hopefully both, we will get rich and we will get old. And uh, the real, my dad was born in Shanghai, and uh, he grew up there in the 1930s. And when I would talk to him about you know, what would go wrong with China, he basically had only one word for me, which was corruption. 
Now, essentially, the only, you know, once you kind of get the picture on this, then the only thing that can really happen is somebody steals the money. Uh, and of course, growing up in 1930s Shanghai, a lot of people were stealing the money. Uh, so that, you know, I think there is the potential for theft on a truly global scale, uh, you know, never unprecedented amounts of money changing hands. And, um, that's why I think capital controls are a good thing for China, uh, has a chan chan at least a tendency to keep all that money more or less where it can do the, be the best. But there's an interesting whole debate going on if you buy Larry Summers around that secular stagnation. We actually have a complete demand shortfall in the rest of the world. So what would happen at the end of the day if you lifted the capital funds? A bunch of money comes in, a lot of money goes out, and so I'm not sure. So um, the uh, you know, net is that, yeah, I, I think we will get old. Uh, and hopefully the institutions for continuing to enhance the productivity of the Chinese economy will keep pace with that, will allow us to create the capital surplus which will be needed. And the last point is that it's a systems issue. I mean, the one accomplishment, I think it's pretty much the one, uh, of, the, uh, of the previous administration was getting 1.3 billion people a health care card. Uh, you know, that is no small task. You know, you try, try to get 1.3 any billion anything. <laughs> And, and so you know, this is a systems problem, and you know, it, and that's not perfect, and it's not, and it's sure. But unless you have the information, our friends, of, I can't remember his name, the, the economist Fernando, whatever is this, uh, Fernando's Apple, oh. and that guy says you have to have the information, otherwise you can't actually enfranchise the population. So, so they've taken some steps, but you know, this will take another mm -hmm. decade or two. Which just shows the strength of the Chinese state, right? The ability mm -hmm. to actually distribute to 1.3 billion people. They know where they are and they can get them their goods. So you wanted to sort of challenge Jack or talk to Jack a little bit about the distribution issue. No, I, I, which I came up in a couple. Of yeah, the distribution is a is a topical thing, and and because uh, first of all, the Gini coefficient in China really measures rural urban, um, and you know if you take the view that uh, you know rural and as opposed to the Gini in the United States, which would basically measure urban. Uh, urban poverty versus urban accomplishment. And if you take the view in the, in, in that ultimately there's this grass, grand shift and uh, that we're going to be, so a lot of this uh, decline in the rural population is, is a secular structural <coughs> shift which will happen like it or not. And so, you know, are we looking at the right set of inequality? That's, that, that's, that's you know, I, I, I have a question on the numbers, but it, that, that said, yes, I mean, clearly, again, this, this I sort of made the point that, you know, the, the only answer to this one from an economic perspective is to channel more capital to the service sector, the small and medium-sized enterprises, which will give people a stake. And then, yeah, try to avoid repeating the, the history, the errors of the past. I have to say, I mean, there's a reason why there is spatial inequality. People vote with their feet. And uh, that uh, they... That for trying to work against that essentially reinforces the structures that created the inequality in the first place. And so they, and while you know, I think this is a debate that every society needs to have about how and where it should allocate uh, its, its the amount of resources it chooses to defend a traditional way of life. Let me give you another country's example: Saudi Arabia, uh, which is currently going through a massive debate about whether, in fact, it should invest in you know, building up economies in the far north of the country in these sort of rural, area, you know, very, very remote areas, or should it invest in literally picking up the towns and moving them to Riyadh or, or Jeddah? You know, which is the better, which is the right answer? Should we try to sustain a traditional way of living with all that implies socially uh, in, uh, in, the, in the remote desert areas? Or should we say, no, nah, this is gone. Uh, you guys need to come to the big city and uh, we'll pay you to do that. So I mean, this, these, are, these are tough choices, but I think that that's, you know, the Chinese answer on this one has been, uh, we don't actually have that much money in the federal budget. <laughs> So it's a, it's a fairly Darwinian process, and you know, you, that's, so everybody gets to compete, and whoever, whoever grows faster wins, and in the case of the Chinese authority, that means bigger cities tend to win, which is, which is what, what's happening. And Jack, what about the question about the vocational misfit in the educational system in the Middle East? Um, I want to get to all those questions. I just want to know how much time you'll give me to cover the next 30 years. <laughs> um, and as it happens, my mother and father actually met in Shanghai. 30s. We didn't plan this. It's just the kind of world that we're in now. Um, on the educational point that you make, you're absolutely right. And to me, I mean, I'm delighted to be here at uh, Oxford and Blavatnik because this question points out the need for the type of thing done here. And that is, there are a lot of people in the world looking for solutions. And education is sometimes presented as the solution to inequality, growth, whatever. But so education is a very complicated system, and if you don't think in systemic terms, what type of education for which people is needed, given the level of economic development for the moment, you get things wrong and you make a mess. 
And this is what's happened because in many developing countries, very good, useful emphasis on primary education, uh, literacy is important. Problem is, if you stop there and you don't invest in secondary education and teaching colleges, then you don't get good teachers for the primary schools, and the education is often of little value. You have teachers who are overburdened, don't show up, uh, don't have supplies. Um, so the quality of education is crucial, and for that you need a system that makes sure teachers are in class, students have books, buildings are heated, and without that backup system, just saying, oh, we have more schools, we have more pupils, you're not getting the value. And if you don't have secondary and vocational education, but you have an economy that is still largely a blue-collar manufacturing economy, and frankly, for countries that need jobs, they need labor-intensive production, not capital-intensive production, right? And so again, you have to think in terms of a system. What do we need for our population? We need jobs. We need, therefore, training to let people be productive in those kind of jobs. Uh, and if you have those skilled workers, then you can invest profitably in those enterprises. But that hasn't happened. What's happened is because higher education is prestigious, there's been over-expansion of higher education, and people are drawn to that because they're promised you'll get a white-collar job, you'll get a government job, you'll get a more prestigious wife, uh, all of these good things, but then you end up, you know, and, and this is a problem actually all across. I mean, the United States has too many ill-trained college graduates, and we don't do as, and now we're looking at the German model and saying, you know, we, we actually need to train people for real jobs. We should have apprentice systems where people spend part of their time in a classroom and part of their time in a factory learning how to do valuable things. And there's a need for plumbers and auto mechanics and people who can do construction, landscaping. You know, that's not going away. Um, so the, what I'm telling people, and this is a bit, for me, this is a really kind of big campaign, especially for Africa, we need education that works as a system and not just education as a solution. Um, now, in terms of uh, the question that you raised about you know, the hope and the fear and, and what do we see, um, this also needs thinking as a system. You can't just say, oh, we'll build cities and throw everybody into cities because yes, that increases productivity if the cities are well run and if there's a demand for the products. But if you don't have an export market and you don't have people coming to the city with skills and adequate infrastructure, you get slums and crime. So it's all got to be uh, thought of. But I'll give you some positive things. Germany was horrible on immigration throughout the 60s and 70s. They had a guest worker program. They treated migrants as semi-welcome guests who would never become Germans and who the sooner we could do without them, the better. And then a number of people pointed out that, you know, Germans are um, having second cars instead of second kids. And at this rate, the number of Germans is going to drop very sharply. We're going to not have labor for the factories. We're not going to have people <coughs> keeping German language, culture. We're going to look at, you know, population may drop by half because fertility rate's about 1.5. And attitudes toward migration started to shift. They started to, Germans started to recognize, we actually, we're going to need more workers to keep our world-beating industries going. And pathways were opened up for immigrants to get citizenship. Discrimination was... Uh, Turkish residents were encouraged to enter professions, enter politics. And compared to 10 or 15 years ago, the attitude now in Germany toward migration is much better. Obviously, it's not ideal. America is not ideal, even though we're the best melting pot society. We still have a lot of hidden racism. But things are much better, say, in Germany now than they are even in Britain or Holland, where there's still much more antagonism about migration. Uh, so, it's possible to overcome prejudices if leaders convince people there is a need to tap into the talent base of the world. That it's not going to hurt Europe to have immigrants, it's actually going to help. It's going to help everyone grow richer instead of make them poorer. Uh, even China is going to need labor migrants in the future. I'm not so much worried about China getting older as the fact that the number of young people entering the labor force in China is going to drop like a stone in the next 20 years. They're going to have a lot of workers, but they're going to be workers in their 40s and 50s and not enough workers in their 20s. And for that, they'll need migrants too. But the real issue for China and aging is what happens in Korea and Japan. China has big financial reserves. They have a lot of room to increase the productivity of the labor force. So they can manage an aging population for another few decades. 
Japan is about to enter 20 years of rapid aging as the post-World War II society gets, the people who were born right after World War II, I mean, starts moving into their 60s and 70s. Um, they're entering that situation with a debt that is 200% of GDP at a currently high level of productivity per worker, so it's hard to see how that's gonna increase very much. And they need radical solutions to make it inexpensive and enjoyable for elderly people to live their lives. And if the Japanese and the South Koreans can figure out how to do that, Chinese will enthusiastically adopt it and make it available to the world at lower prices, and we'll all be better off. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they will come up with something, but it is a huge challenge. I think, um, I, that's a good point, and I think that you, we, we are seeing some of that in Japan now, which is going to be kind of cool. Um, the, um, I guess the one thing I want to take slight issues is it's not something you said, but more of the toning about slums. And um, my basic view is that slums are not so bad. Uh, that you know certainly they're better than rural destitution. And uh, at the end of the day, people do vote with their feet. So if they if it was if it was also awful as we think it is, then you know then people would have would have gone back to the countryside, and that's just not what we see. Uh, the you know the Brazil case, we had you know massive urbanization up to you know, about a 60 or 65 percent level, of, and, and we had lockstep growth in GDP per capita. And, this, and in about at the 70s, that relationship broke down. All of a sudden, we kept on urbanizing, went from 60 up to 75 or 80. We got flat line on, on GDP per capita. And so why? What happened? Well, everybody who was in Brazil in the 70s and 80s might remember what was going on back there. It was the year of hyperinflation. So essentially, somebody stole all the money. Uh, they took it to Miami and New York. And then, uh, as you know, people kept on going into the into the megalopolises and nobody spent any money. So today, the infrastructure stock as a share of GDP for Brazil is 40%. Well, the average is 70. Uh, China is 70. Uh, okay, you can go too far. Japan is 170. But uh, you know, clearly, you know, if you don't spend the money, you can get a worse outcome. But at the same time, that's where they are. And if, I think the most recent research shows, I mean, the favelas per se, are actually the most economically dynamic part of the, of, of the economy, and that this is where we do see continued productivity growth. Now, it's a question of how we support this type of urban growth, but I don't think there is an alternative. There is just, we are an urban species, that's who we are. If we had cameras in outer space and watched the earth for you know, billions of years, we'd see nothing, and then the lights would come on and those would be cities. Uh, and we would say, we are the species that build cities. It's not really a why question. It's really more about how do we do it better. That's a great point. Yes. Javier? There's a little microphone there. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, Luis Filippi from the Center of Public Leadership. Jack, I like very much your statement on Germany. And that's a, a preoccupation I do have. The two breaks on economic growth is elderly population, getting people getting older, so you don't have incentive. And the other is the question of inequality. It's also something that let's put a break on growth and try to solve the question of inequality. So I think that those are two great challenges for growth. So do you think those two challenges will make a completely change in our perspective about immigration in the world? People be more tolerant or it will be more resistant? Um, Jack and Jonathan, I'd, thanks for coming. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. On, we've spoken about intergenerational, uh, the change in demographics, aging populations. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts uh, regarding what resolutions you see when generations come into conflict regarding the expenditure, not just of public funds, but potentially also investment. I'm thinking particularly of the, around climate change, where a lot of the investments that we will see that will support the portfolios in the Western world of our aging population and their well-being um, will directly uh, impinge upon the ability of future generations to create their own well-being. Do we see a situation where it continues to go in the direction of one generation until they die, and then we see a swing back in the other direction? Or do you think that that will be resolved in a different way? Another question? We'll take three. Thank you, MC, um, MPP candidate of Blavonic School of Government. My question is about the scale of communities in a country as big as China. Well, in practice of urbanization, there are two roads ahead. One way is to develop 
huge cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, the other way is to uh, work on this concept of township and gradually develop medium and small size cities. Which way do you think is more sustainable and how can we achieve that? Thank you. So, um, Jack, this sort of the, the, the dueling aging populations and inequality, um, is, it a pro is it going to be a problem or not? And it sort of feeds into the second question about intergenerational equity that came up in the last round of questions. Um, and then I think Jonathan will turn to you about what size? Too big? Is it too small? <laughs> Well, I'm going to come back to your area of expertise, and that is religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm here in a research university. We don't always get into religious and value issues, but I think they will matter terribly because what we decide to do about intergenerational equity and inequality comes back to the value we put on is it the job of society to make everyone better off, or is it the job of society to create kind of a maximum efficiency world for the generation of private wealth? Um, you know, it used to be that uh, you know, it was harder for the rich man to get to heaven than get through the eye of the needle. Um, we don't worry so much about that anymore. The, the number of wealthy people who feel embarrassed by their wealth or compelled to share it is still significant. There's a lot of great private philanthropy. I look at what Bill Gates has done. It's a very impressive. But that's not the norm. It's, it's not what people generally aspire to. Um, and so, you know, we used to say, well, the future is our children. So in the long run, we're all dead. Well, we used to hope that in the long run, our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren would still be here and have a better life than we do. And so there was a commitment to the future. It wasn't a, a problem of uh, older generations saying we have to protect our wealth even at the expense of the young. It was always the case that society invested in the young people because they were the future. As far as I know, this is kind of the first generation that stopped doing that, that says it's perfectly fine to spend much more per capita on older people than on young people. And this is starving our future, but this is what we're doing. Now, can we turn that around? Uh, same thing with regard to inequality between rich and poor. It really comes to a values issue. Now, you know, we, we had a pope who was very focused on maintaining um, hierarchy within the church and the authority of practice and the sanctity of male uh, priesthood. Uh, and that was important because he felt that those things were under threat. But now we have a new pope who seems much more focused on uh, the kind of virtues of caring for the poor, supporting society. He doesn't care so much about competition between religions. He seems to be open to any faith as long as it supports uh, people who are struggling. Now that's a very different orientation. And so if you get that kind of leadership and those kind of values, and that motivates people who are voting and that affects leaders, then we might see this. Because th there's no reason we can't spend less on, um, you know, very wealthy pensioners and spend more on children who need nutrition education. Some countries do this, others don't. But if the global standard should be who does the best job of preparing our youth for the future instead of who does the best job in uh, maximizing GDP per capita or who has the most millionaires, it would be a different world. So I think if we get to that kind of world, a lot of these problems uh, become practical ones and that we can figure out how to do rather than these political how do we do it? Well, Jonathan, you've written on China and sort of the, the environment. How are they thinking about this intergenerational equity? Uh, they've got this big aging population. The first question was about um, whether they get wealthy before they got old. It looks like they're going to get old. Um, on the other hand, we all know that health, we, we, we live healthier longer, 60s and 70s and 60s, you know, that sort of mantra. But how is China thinking about these environmental issues and also balancing future <coughs> and pre preparing, especially since the family structure is broken down, and this was a society where the elders were revered, my understanding is the Chinese now use the word cousin for sibling, that they're actually, the, the family structure has really changed culturally. It's a sociological phenomenon now that going to our policy. It's changed the way people think about family. Okay, uh, great. First of all, great question. I mean, first of all, I'm going for 100, so I, I fully <laughs> intend to see the outcome of the climate change. Uh, you know, so, not, not just my kids. So, um, yeah, I, no, it's a, great, uh, it's a great and impossible to answer question. No, of because course. I could tell you what, what the Chinese government has done so far, which is essentially all the stuff that's sort of the low hanging fruit. It's economically positive, it meets security of supply objectives, and yeah, it's good for the environment. 
Um, so, you know, energy efficiency is kind of the classic. Uh, and yeah, investing in, in fossil fuel reserves, gas reserves that we might have domestically, uh, the uh, support for wind, solar, you name it. All these things, they look economically attractive, reduce dependence on imported oil, and yeah, they're good for climate change. So, uh, and it's more or less in that order. <laughs> the, uh, you know, as to whether we now take the next step and do stuff that isn't quite as attractive, that costs a lot more, and that will have some benefit for you know, 40, 50 years down the line, the country you know, built by and for engineers. Uh, so, in the sense that you know, the, they, they'll run the number and figure out, well, you know, how much do I really want to invest in this, and you know, is it worth gearing up state grid to do a lot more on solar? And I think they sort of decided to pull the trigger on that. There is a, so I think specific policy. Uh, this this will not come down to a you know blanket view. Uh, it will be more about what is practical and feasible, um, recognizing that there. In, there are real short-term consequences for an economy like China, which does not continue to provide jobs uh, for, the, for the parents of those children. Uh, that that the, the negative health impacts of not actually having a job for you know, a migrant kid, or perhaps uh, the parents are probably bigger than their long-term consequences. But that said, yeah, I mean, we recognize there's, a, there, there, there's kind of an issue here. Um, the, the breakdown of society, I, I think there's a, you know, there is a, Restructuring around, uh, you know, or what is an urban family and what does it mean to be a Chinese, uh, a, a, a Chinese person? Um, I, I, there's, there's still a healthy core of, of family values. I mean, I, 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 I work with migrant kids in, in Shanghai, and I ask them, who are you? And they've been in Shanghai their entire life, and, and, uh, and they say, I'm from Anhui. Because uh, that's where their family is, and you know, still grandma and grandpa are there, or something like that, in either village. Now, it's going to change, but it's going to take another couple of decades, I think, before we really start to see the restructuring. I see. And what about the the question on scale of cities? Uh, yeah, uh, this this history of urban planning is replete with people who say it can't be bigger than X. And, uh, <laughs> so, technological you know, city is technology. It's uh, it you know, and it's fundamentally limited by our capacity to. Uh, productively in engaged. I mean, yes, at some point when we run out of the ability to of govern the scarce resource, usually governance related, then 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 the city stops growing. And uh, I, I like to think Fiorello LaGuardia used to say, "There's no Republican or Democratic way to take out the garbage. Um, everybody has to do this. So city government just has to work." So Tokyo is 35 million people. I don't know, why not China's urbanization 10 Tokyos? Okay, well, probably we don't have a lot of the governance capacity, and also these things do require a fairly unique set of infrastructure, uh, notably around water, uh, which, will, which will create some constraints here. So we basically see, I see a clusters. So we'll have you know, a you know, set of 20 to 20, this is a China is big story, uh, 20 to 25 clusters, each one of which is 50 to 80 million people, roughly the size of a European country, uh, which is composed of a hub city of anywhere between 10 to 15 million people, another 50 subsidiary spokes of between 0 0.3 to, to 1.5 million people, and that's kind of it. You know, that's kind of the, the model, if you will, for China's urbanization. That'll be 65% of the population. Uh, by 2030, so, and there's a lot of a parlor game about you know where's Poland, where's France, where's Germany, and so Shanghai is Germany, and uh, Pro River Delta is UK or something like that. But that's that's roughly the scale we're talking about here. So your question about you know what's the what's the maximum? Well, good question. I mean, I think Shanghai could easily get to 40, could easily get to 40 million. Um, uh, maybe not in five years, but you know, 15, 20 years could get there. I hope it doesn't get much bigger than that. The uh, you know, as far as the smallest, well, you know, this uh, Chinese towns start at 150,000, I think. I think the technical definition is 150,000. Mm -hmm. So, three more questions. Um, so, uh, my Manuel Muniz, I'm a doctoral student here. I, I think you've um, orbited the subject, but I was wondering if you could speak about the, the politics uh, of demographics uh, in democratic states and also in China, because this is, I mean, pensioners are clearly a very a highly entrenched constituency. It's a very difficult thing to reform, you know, pension reform in Europe, despite the crisis that the reforms we've seen in the southern periphery of Europe have been, you know, very small. New governments have even backtracked and changed reforms of previous governments re regarding retirement age and also pension benefits. Uh, and I think this is a huge issue because it's growing, uh, that, you know, the debt to pensioners is growing. The, size of the pensioner 
population is also growing, which makes it even politically more complicated. So I was wondering if you could comment on that from the perspective of democracies and countries that are not that democratic. Um, my name is Stephen. I'm an MPP student here. Um, I wanted to come back to a point made earlier, um, which was about corruption. And um, my perception is, um, on the minds of many Chinese, if you mention what are you know a few of the issues that you really uh, that bugs you, uh, corruption is one of those, uh, along with inequality, that comes up a lot. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, for Dr. Ward, so if you see. Um, it as a barrier to sustainable governance in China, and how do the the Chinese government see this problem? Whether they think they're able to deal with it systemically, um, uh, and and maybe for Dr. Uh, Goldstone, if from you know even from international perspectives, uh, what we might have to learn about this issue of corruption is it really an issue, and how can it be really dealt with? Because it does come back so often to that. Um, thank you for the discussion so far. I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on what you think is the interplay between the vectors of aging population, armed uh, military strength, and um, immigration. Because countries like many countries in the EU don't have conscription anymore, whereas many big nations these days do maintain large standing armies, but at the same time are facing issues of an aging population, which places a strength, uh, a strain on their youth resource that they cannot just have so much people just being employed in the standing military. And so how do you see those three vectors coming into play? And does it at all bring into play a mercenary culture again where you may outsource your military strength somehow. Thank you. All right, so um, we'll start with the Jack, and I think, Jonathan, you could talk to the, the, the democratic, uh, democracies dealing with democratic problems. We know that democracies tend to think short term. What's interesting about, as you know, demography is long term, it's generational. Some governments are playing catch up. The UK government's talking about the pension raising the age to 70, but it's not until 2030. I right. mean, this is... Well, here's the thing. <laughs> um, governments are waking up to this now in a way that, you know, if you, if you tried to talk to people about demography 15 years ago, you couldn't get anywhere. People would go to sleep, they'd say, that's for accountants and uh, <laughs> bureaucrats and have the Social Security Administration send me a report next month. Now, it is starting to matter. People like yourself ask questions about, we have the baby boomers are about to retire, they've already started retiring. This is impacting our finances, what do we do? So it, the fact that it's now on the agenda for policymakers means we have a better chance of tackling it. Um, in terms of what is democracy going to demand, if it depends on whether people have a, a pie image or a balloon image of the economy. If your image of the economy is there's a fixed pie and all you can do is carve it up and the older generation wants to make sure they get their share, it's gonna be a fight and a bitter fight and one which probably the younger generation will lose. Although everyone's gonna to have to give something up. But if you say, no, the economy is like a balloon, it will grow according to how much air we put into it. And so if we really focus on growing the economy for everyone and making the adjustments we need, then we can solve the problems without too much friction. I mean, in the United States, we have a pension problem, but it's because we refuse to raise taxes. Uh, if, we were, if we raised taxes to Brazilian levels, we'd have enough money to solve all kinds of problems for education, health care, and so on. The other thing is we're trying to bend back. You know, pensions are an issue, but health care for the elderly is much more expensive. And if we can bend back the curve of health care for the elderly, um, then the problem gets to be much less of a, of a significance. So if you have people who are in their 70s who are healthy and working instead of needing chronic medical support and not working, it changes everything. Now, uh, you know, you, Jonathan, want to be to 100. Uh, great, but can you keep working until you're 80? That's what I want to know. Uh, um, 
Great. I interviewed Buckminster Fuller when he was, you know, yeah. 83. He was yeah, no, that, and, <laughs> and frankly, that, you know, 60 could be the new 40 because 60-year-olds now are pretty healthy. The real question for the future is whether 80 will be the new 60. That is, whether the years from 60 to 80 can be as healthy and productive as the years from 40 to 60 used to be. And then if you can retire for 20 years from 80 to 100, that's plenty of retirement for most people. Yeah, right? the word retire, I just don't. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the other issue on this. We, we need to rethink what retirement means, because right now we have this crazy old-fashioned notion that the way your life should be is you're a full-time worker until some birthday, whether it's 65 or 67 or 69. Some place is 63. And the day, well, yeah, in Korea it's like 56. Uh, and then the day after that birthday, you're completely retired and out of the workforce. And why does it have to be so black and white? Uh, I keep telling people we should think of retirement as a phased-in process. That, you know, the older you are, the more vacation time you should earn. And so maybe by the time you're 60, you should get a few extra weeks of vacation. By the time you're 70, you get a few extra months of vacation. And by the time you're 80, you think about retirement altogether. Some, but maybe not for others. But this notion that you have to leave the workforce completely is tied to ideas about obsolescence and the need to create space for young people that are no longer accurate. So we need to change retirement altogether, and we need to change the cost structure altogether. So That's Jonathan, really cool. corruption. Small topic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just one one factoid. I think McKinsey directors are supposed to retire, you know, from the firm. We have to give our shares back at you know age fifty-five or sixty. I can't remember exactly the number. Um, and uh, and then we've done some research apparently on this, and I think that actually less than one percent of McKinsey directors retire. <laughs> Says they stop working. They're always there's always a second act. So. You know, what is, you know, this, this, just a factoid there, there's, there's, there's going to be a second act. The, um, so corruption, um, yeah, I mean, it's a cost. And so ultimately, corruption imposes a tax on, on transactions. And at some point, if that tax gets so high that enough transactions stop happening, then money get, leaves the system. And it doesn't, you, get, you get the failure of, of resources to be invested. As a result, you cannot increase the productivity of the economy. And with that, you, you, have a, you have a slower growth rate. And so at some points, that's, I think, you get, one can get stuck in this, this, this stagnant, stagnant environment where, you know, for whatever reason, an elite is saying it's worth more to me to keep things like they are uh, than uh, my belief in the future that having, you know, giving a, you know, taking my tax and giving it back to the society in some way, you know, that, yes, that'll get a higher, you know, basically the elite has a really high discount rate. Mm -hmm. and so, so that, you know, that's not a good place. And, I honestly feel like that's where Latin America had been for you know, much, of, uh, much of the last two decades. So, you know, with exceptions, and I'm vastly oversimplifying. But uh, you know, I, I, would, uh, you know, I, I would say that there is, first of all, uh, the urban environment is, by its very nature, inherently more open and more, it has the potential to create more uh, transparency, just because there's a, it's a much more dense, much more frequent set of interactions. So, we're going to say, you know, where is corruption worse? I'd, I'd much rather have corruption in an urban environment where there's a lot of people being affected by it. We might all get together one day and protest in Tahrir Square uh, than to have corruption in some, you know, rural place where nobody even know it happened and a tree fell in the forest and we didn't hear it. So, you know, that, you know, for me is that inherently it's an it's a optimistic trajectory because when we see what's going on, we react to it, and it's resilient, and, and, and our political structure is in turn forced to do that, and we see that in China. We see that you know, with the viral photographs of you know, the official's wristwatch, so who's got an expensive wristwatch in their hand, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know hundreds of thousands of people are, are tweeting about this guy's wristwatch, and then he has to go on, how did he get this expensive wristwatch? It's a, it's a wild thing. Or in Mexico City, where the daughter of the food safety inspector, you know, goes into the restaurant and can't get a table, and then calls her dad to shut down the, ta the restaurant for food safety violations, and then everybody else is sitting in the restaurant and says, wait a second, who is that woman, who is that guy? And, he, and eventually the, the, the food safety inspector, you know, head has to go on national television to say, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to, to do that. That was a mistake. <laughs> um, <and> so, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this, this transparency in the urban environment, I think, is better. Now, 
There are some you know, real issues here. Microfinance has not happened in China, largely because, and this may be an excuse, but basically they say we don't trust the bank, man the bank branch managers. That we, we, we can't be sure that you know, this person won't just take a lot of money from farmers and steal it. <laughs> and he's, he's our own branch manager, but there's absolutely no way of, understand, of, of keeping track of that. That's why we don't want the Grameen Bank to do whatever it's going to do. So that, that could be an excuse, but you, know, you can say accept the fact that there is, there, there is, a, there is a systems issue here. So. Yeah. Um, so there was that other question, Jack, I think it was directed toward you, but Jonathan, you could talk to it as well about military manpower and sort of, in the old days, we used to put the testosterone-driven young men into the military to keep them under control. The problem is in an aging Europe, we don't have them. But in China, there's still a large standing army, and there's also the issue of bare branches, that you've got a deficit of women in China. Yeah. And so people, scholars, academics have made the argument that China will always have a standing army because they actually have to funnel some of these men who can't find girlfriends and then wives somewhere and keep an eye on them. So Jack, you know, you've written on national security. Right. Well, the people. point that you raise is really a good one. And it's, it's almost kind of like retirement in that the demographic changes in the world are so radical that it requires us to rethink the institutions under which we've lived for the last 30 or 40 years. So we've had a world in which um, NATO was the bulwark alliance for the rich countries of North America and Europe. Um, but all of those countries now are aging. And you say, and wherever else does the US have alliances in the world, it's with Japan and South Korea that are also aging. So you have all these countries that are facing the same problem. Um, and so what I tell people is, we need to rethink what NATO is all about and how it's put together. If the job of NATO is no longer to defend Europe from an advancing uh, Eastern Bloc, what is its purpose? Well, it turns out the places NATO is active today are places like Mali, Central African Republic, uh, Afghanistan. In a sense, NATO is becoming concerned with protecting uh, law and order, dealing with uh, you know, risks of mass atrocities, and trying to defend uh, order and rights around the world. For that, we need a different partnership. We need partnerships with countries like Brazil and India that are democracies with a lot of young people where it's not quite so expensive to train and arm a military. But those countries, they want access to the advanced technology that's available from uh, NATO. So for me, the obvious solution is to rethink national security in terms of a global human rights structure rather than a territorial boundary across Eastern Europe and to rethink what are the needs of that structure? It needs a cooperation of both populous and aging countries, but it has to be done on a basis of partnership and equality. It can't be the place anymore of rich countries to say, oh, Turkey, Brazil, you're immature, you know, you're not gonna be full partners. This problem of keeping Turkey out of the European Union, of neglecting partnerships with Mexico and Brazil, uh, that's gotta change. So I think the, the, the new solution for global security really is a new architecture of global alliances. And on the China side, I think the, uh, one of the four modernizations, one of them was the army. You know, essentially, it was a deal that Deng Xiaoping cut with the general was, was we'll, uh, we'll fund you, uh, but you gotta get rid of you know, basically a third of your, your manpower. So he cut the Chinese military by about 30% between 1978 and, 19, and 1990. Uh, that reflected a, a policy in, which is in, in effect today about professionalization and the use of science and technology. So uh, I think the military is unlikely to become a growth sector for, for employment in China going forward. That said, we have this issue in that, you know, it's a, at some point people will wake up and realize that having, you know, 70 million unemployed young men may not be a competitive advantage. Uh, so this, you know, this does create a that much more impetus for, you know, jobs in the service sector. And, well, the only other way we should, I see the military really uh, figuring is uh, science and technology. And that, uh, as we know, that the military is the single largest funder of R and D in, in, in every country in the world, for that matter, and OECD. And so, if you look at Silicon Valley, it was established by the Department of Defense. Uh, this is something that we don't typically talk about in polite company. So, the, uh, and China recognizes this very well. But that is, again, we're not talking about people. We're talking about, or we're not talking about the average peasant. We're talking about, obviously, you know, educated and PhD uh, in molecular biology and, uh, and microelectronics. So, you know, that, kind of, that kind of demand we're going to see in, in for, from the Chinese military. Mm -hmm. So, do we have time for three more questions? Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Boone, and I study water policy at the School of Geography here. Um, if 
Professor Wutzel, uh, I was interested, you made a comment really early on that you know, when people move to the city, they become different people. And I think that that is um, exceptionally true in, response, or in relation to their environmental behavior and consumption. So I wanted to talk or ask about sustainability. Uh, with people moving to rapidly urbanizing areas, um, it's been pretty documented that people move toward greater consumption of environmental uh, resources, and I'm, of course, particularly interested in water, which you mentioned. Um, water s scarcity is certainly a reality, um, and I was wondering, what do you see uh, as the government's role in demand management versus um, to what extent you think that peeper, people power movements um, are necessary in sort of achieving environmental sustainable, uh, sustainability and behavior change? My question is also about sustainability. Sorry, oh, I'm James Tilbury from the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. So this talk is on growth and sustainability, two terms that most people, at least some people, would consider contradictory, because they assume that growth is growth in GDP and there's growth in finite resources, the consumption of those resources, which is mathematically impossible. So my question is, do you think it's possible to shift our attention away from growing GDP to growing something that's a little bit more in line with well-being and sustainability? Thank you. So do you want to take them? Jonathan, do you want to take them? Sure. Uh, I'll tee off on this. The, um, let me start with the second one. It's, um, it's more fun. Uh, <laughs> the water one is, 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 is the important one. But, uh, <laughs> sustainability and growth. Um, if one was to attempt to deliver the standard of living that we all enjoy here in Oxford, in the uh, rural wastelands of, I don't know, you pick your favorite you know, countryside, would easily require you know, multiple of factor inputs. <laughs> so in fact, urbanization is, an urban environment is the more environmentally sustainable way of delivering uh, a uh, greater level of activity. Now we can quarrel whether or not we want the activity. That would be the appropriate conversation. So do we want to support the benefits, the co-benefits, if you will, of the environmental investment that we're making uh, in the hope that at some point we can mitigate the impacts of that. And I only note that the urbanization is, and a higher standard of, of urban income is directly correlated, or inversely, so I should say, correlated with gender inequality, with racial inequality, uh, with just about any kind of inequality we want to mention. <laughs> and so this, this notion that we can somehow separate the uh, uh, that, that, we, we, that there, there's a place where somehow those benefits will happen that is not in a city, uh, it strikes me as, as uh, contrary to the facts. So you know, I think there is, in that sense, a clear vote for a you know, higher activity state, which results in more, more access for more people to more potential. Now that comes, yes, with a impact on our uh, on our natural resources, and but we're doing that all the time. And as I say, it's a question for me. I'm, I, I will, you know, take my take my stand as a technological optimist and say that you know we we need to be fully accounting for the costs of that growth, and that the real question for us is: Do we accept that cost? Are we? And if we don't accept that, that is what bad environmental policy is. Bad environmental policy is where we refuse to acknowledge the health impacts, the climate change impacts, the, uh, the uh, I would say, social impacts of mistaken or, or simply uh, uh, unthought about decisions, whether it's about mobility, uh, about how we use resources and energy or, or water, that those things all come with externalities. And so the, the understanding those externalities and, and uh, or recognizing and in so doing changing the policies that are needed, that, that is the the role of a well-functioning uh, urban, uh, urban society and for policymakers. So to the question here specifically on water, right? water is a resource uh, that, first of all, we cannot do without. So this, this tends to get it very, very, very much top of mind in any conversation, at least when you start to run out of it. Uh, the reality, of course, 65, 70 percent of water usage is still agricultural. So I mean, that's, that is you know, the biggest single issue is how do we ensure that this does not become simply a 
fight over, uh, over, over land, over resources that are monopolized in some ways, that you know, the, the agricultural tariffing and right, prices to farmers, uh, subsidies to farmers, uh, those, are, those are big water issues. If we get into the cities, then we're talking about industry, which I think is something where government is probably largely uh, the player in the sense of setting standards and regulations. We know from our experience in energy efficiency that people will not you know, will not do much unless they are told, unless a certain level of standard is applied, an amount of, uh, that transparency is made. Every factory has to essentially say how much water it's using, and you know, this kind of uh, public, uh, public debate is, is engendered by, it needs facts. Um, so that's, that I think in industry is, is, is a prerequisite. Uh, then we, and as we get into the, you know, the space of the home, I think there, first of all, there is tremendous power of transparency. We've seen a lot of uh, you know, a lot of utilities start to essentially tell people, we don't tell you exactly how much your neighbors make, but we'll tell you, you know, these are the hundred apartments in this building in terms of the consumption per capita, and you are here. <laughs> and that has an amazing ability to change behavior. So I, I think, again, transparency uh, of information is, a, is, is probably the, the most powerful lever. And yes, tariffing, where, where things have been subsidized for decades, and if you don't, if you, if you don't change or, again, recognize the externality that the overuse or the misuse or the, the true cost of delivering that resource uh, implies, then yeah, people will waste it. And uh, so we should, we, should, we should recognize that. Did you want to add yeah, I, I did want to backtrack a little bit on what I said about cities. I've deferred to Jonathan, who's the expert on this. Um, but here's the thing. Size is irrelevant. Tokyo with 35 million is a much nicer place to live than Detroit, which is down to 700,000. So the real question is whether cities work for the people who live in them. Now, the, the nature of human beings, we are an urban species. Um, given the choice, most people do prefer to live in cities. The constraint has been the productivity of agriculture. Modern, efficient agriculture allows 85% of populations to live in cities. That's probably the reasonable equilibrium to which China, Africa, the Middle East are headed. And that's fine, because people in cities have more interesting lives. They mix with more people and tend to overcome local prejudices. They have more options in terms of mixing uh, culture. And they're centers for that reason of innovation. So I think cities are great. The more people who live in cities, generally the better. And slums are kind of a normal transition as people move into the cities with few resources. They have to set up somewhere. Eventually, they get better. The Bowery in New York was kind of an inevitable stage. So all of those things, I say, I, I agree with you. What I'm concerned about is when governments neglect to provide the resources to make cities better places. If they don't pay attention to the pollution consequences so that resources get fouled and children die, if they don't try and do something for uh, safety codes, infrastructure, sanitation, if they don't address uh, crime. And in some cases, people are fleeing a countryside for environmental disasters, lack of opportunities, uh, strict controls on land by rural landlords. And they're coming to cities out of desperation, and then they're prone to mobilization into radical movements, criminal networks, and other problems. So I think urbanization is one of the triumphs of humanity. We became, for the first time in human history, a majority urban species at the beginning of this century. That's the future. But like any other future, it can work better or worse, depending on how we manage it. Thanks, Victor Finkel, a graduate of the MPP last year. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on this about, uh, similar to James's, about actually including a consideration of the consequences of a, a pro-growth strategy, which you've both talked about extensively. But it does still seem that the language of development and discourse is primarily around GDP as the metric that we target. And while there is an absolutely defensible course for doing that, which is that poverty is the overwhelming need, it would seem that having GDP front and center in the discourse precisely gives people the cover not to consider the consequences of urbanization and development that you both highlighted as being essential for us to consider. So the question ultimately is recognizing the need to do all that. How do we actually shape political debate and does that require us to move beyond GDP as the metric we look at? Thank you. Yeah. That's a nice last question because it gets back to your values yeah. point. Uh, um, I would say every effort that I've seen, and I've been parts of lots of them, to find other metrics than GDP to guide planning and growth, they fail to work because people have such diverse interests. Some people will say health is most important. Other people will say eliminating 
poverty extreme levels is most important. Others say environment most important. The only way to resolve those things, I think, is through having a healthy political process that operates as kind of a counterbalance to private market. So you allow people in the marketplace to seek wealth and growth, but you allow people to vote when that growth hurts them, and sometimes they vote with protest. What we've seen in China and Russia and the Soviet Union before that is that environmental issues, even in autocracies, are often the leading edge of mobilization for greater uh, democracy and constraint on government. So in a sense, I'd say encourage uh, openness, communication, uh, encourage people to express themselves, and you'll get a balance between pursuit of GDP and pursuit of things that people value. It's when you start shutting down growth, like if when the Chinese government buys out land, moves peasants, builds sterile apartments, moves the peasants into those apartments and said, all right, see, now you're better off, right? And they actually feel lost. They've lost their community, their way of life. They don't know what to do with themselves when they're not farming anymore. Then they start using their voice to say, we're victims now. You're not helping us. You're not improving things. So I think it will all work out as long as we continue this, you know, give people uh, protest power. Yeah, I, I like that. And um, just to build on what you were saying, first of all, the, the third plan on this came out and it said that, you know, that the, that the cities are now going to be evaluated by their function, which is Chinese, you know, party speak for saying that we're going to, so not everybody has to have the same metric. So that implies over 50% of the districts in, in China won't have GDP as their primary growth metric because there'll be something else. Uh, there'll, there'll be an ecological area, there'll be, a, there'll be a residential area, there'll be something else. So that, that is, a, you know, I think, just a step in this, this direction. The, uh, you know, but to your point, I said, start by the back, there is a high correlation between economic, environmental, and social progress. You really can't separate these things. So even if we're saying it's all about GDP growth, at the end of the day, you come back and say, we can't grow this GDP anymore this way. I mean, and so it's natural. You see, that's why Shanghai doesn't have any ferromanganese alloy smelters in it anymore, because people just won't wear that. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are, you know, get out on the street when they say, yes, I, you could build another parazylene plant in downtown. We don't think it's a good idea. Uh, you know, or when a building falls down after, you know, it was built two years ago and said, wow, how did that happen? Well, so there was a problem with the safety codes. Um, so, you know, the, these, these things, uh, I think, are part of this dial debate. So your, your judge's point is absolutely right. I mean, it's the transparency and the, the frequency and density of interactions and the debate, the, the robustness of that conversation that differentiates societies that essentially learn from their mistakes. Uh, we make a lot of mistakes, and that's why, you know, ultimately accountability for those mistakes is what matters. And if the accountability is equal parts authority and responsibility, so that you have, you have a clear set of, a, of resources and you have a mandate to do something with them. So that's, that's why ultimately I would be, again, a city's optimist, saying cities are the place where most of that accountability lies. And so it's, a, you know, in a sense, a, a, a fiction to imagine that there is somebody outside of the people who are involved in this conversation that can ultimately solve the problem. And what is the right balance of metrics? And the last example is the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, came to us to ask the question, how do countries in the world evaluate the quality of urbanization? And I said, there's an implicit hypothesis in your statement that there is such a thing as the National Development and Reform Commission in other countries <laughs> that in fact evaluates anything. <laughs> as I can go out and tell you, you know, give you hundreds of think tanks and other quasi-government entities which have their particular point of view about what is high quality urbanization. That is, uh, and I'm happy to do so. But ultimately, we say what, what is the right answer <clears throat> is something that is the product of a very specific conversation around what is what what do we as a citizenry in this particular city in this particular place want to do at this point in time and are we, are we prepared to wear the consequences of that we the government we the people uh, that that i think is the is the lesson learned and yes now one thing we can do though is we can we can track progress we can make it transparent who has made what kind of choice and then we can ask them why why did you make that choice? And, you, and the answer was, I thought it was, I didn't know any better, is in the, you know, in, in the words of Nuremberg, no longer a satisfying uh, answer. You cannot, you cannot be said that. And these cases, in many cases, are, in fact, crimes against humanity. So I don't think it's, a, it's an inappropriate parallel.
Yeah, well, we're at the end. So for me, you guys get to do, I have three sort of takeaways. The one is the path of urbanization is here to stay. And Jonathan, I really liked your point about we have not witnessed a de-urbanization. So Jack, China right now is at 45%. It's probably going to go to 60%. You're saying the equilibrium may be 85%. Um, but the idea that within people power, people do speak with their feet. And they move to cities, or at least they stay in the cities once they arrive. So that's an interesting thing to take away. The second is, is the channeling of responsibility and transparency within the urban environment. And uh, governments that can do that, can demonstrate that, uh, tend to be more resilient than those that can. And China actually has been successful in doing that. And the question is whether the Kairos and the Nairobi will be able to do that. And the last comes back to the values, which I think we, we're going to just keep turning to for why people are protesting or at least issuing voice. Um, and how people feel about aging and inequity. I think a lot of our conversation was, how do we think about our aging populations? What do we owe them? But then what do we owe our, our younger generations, the environment as well, the degradation of the environment? And thinking about issues of the equitable distribution of what? Income? Victor sort of problematized GDP as the proper metric. Um, and the idea is, what are the values that we as a human society today in a globalized world? And then within our locality or local environments, I think your question about, What's the proper scale? Do we dehumanize ourselves when we put ourselves into these glass and steel structures where we're disembodied from what we knew? Um, and so it comes back to this idea of values. And, um, and then how can states, through politics, through the political process, help individuals and then societies to sort of attain that, attain what, what people as individuals within these communities feel is the value that needs to be promoted? So I'm wondering if you, any last words, or should, are you? Go ahead, Jack. No, I was going to say, our, my generation, I'm 60 now, so I was a baby boomer, we thought we were going to save the world, but we got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow got off on the path of you know, innovation, building Twitter, social networks, making uh, the world a safer place through technology, and making as much money as possible in the process. Uh, somehow, <laughs> while we were doing all this, the carbon load built up. Uh, Developing countries fell into violence. Uh, there were genocides in many parts of the world. Um, all these things that we thought would never happen, you know, when we were thinking in the 60s of the, the age of Aquarius coming. So I, I do hope that the values for this younger generation will remain stronger, more intact. We won't get distracted by the need to, um, uh, you know, accumulate a fortune as much as by the need to make sure the world really will be cleaner and safer for kids. From there. Well, join me in thanking Jack and Jonathan.